a great main event here on this show. Yes. This was a good edition of Ring of Honor. And really, like I said, the NWA show was a good show until, who was it? It was... Um, we uh, Jimmy Garvin killed the show. Oh, God, that's right. It was great all the way up until yeah, Jimmy Garvin. Yeah, we Garvin's need to uh, contact whoever's in charge to make sure he is removed from the Hall of Fame. Oh, for this, this wow. Match. This, is, this is bad. All right. Seriously, yeah. Jimmy Garvin appeared, and it did not get good until Jimmy Valiant appeared at the very end of the show. Even the Arn Anderson match. And even that wasn't as good as Jimmy Valiant's first appearance. As, as we shall see. NWA Championship Wrestling, April 20th, 1986. All right, here's the problem with the show. And it's the same, a similar problem to that retro Raw we just watched. That Raw had half the crew in South Africa and half the crew in the U.S. So it wasn't, they still had two shows to, to work with, but the roster was split. This show was taped Saturday morning slash afternoon, literally during the Crockett Cup. They started the Crockett Cup the night before with the first round matches. And uh, I presume the everything else, the second round of through was Saturday night, along with the world title match. Well, they did claim it was an afternoon session and an evening session. The yeah. afternoon session was over. The evening session was about to start. Yes. And uh, and the Ric Flair Dusty Rhodes world title match, also in the main event of that Saturday night show. So, they showed the Road Warriors and Midnight Express winning matches in the Crockett Cup against teams <laughs> I did not recognize. They did not lose their matches in this Crockett Cup. Nope. David Crockett was back this week. Thank God. In a fabulous green jacket. So Ric Flair comes out for a promo. Well, first off, they made it very clear that this Crockett Cup that they've been building up forever, the evening session is taking place tonight, and it will wrap up. A team is going to walk away with $1 million. And they noted, well, somebody noted later, some people never even see a million dollars in their lifetime. Two men tonight are walking away with a million dollars. It's crazy to think about. It is amazing. Meanwhile, there's a tag team tournament on WWE that has had four matches so far, and they've all fucking sucked. I watched the other two on SmackDown. No better? They sucked. <laughs> okay. Every match has sucked. So Flair notes that he's here in Atlanta to cut this promo, and in 20 minutes, he will take a limousine with Ted Turner. They will go to a Learjet and fly to New Orleans so he can defend his title that night. That is probably all true or very close to it, and if you've seen any... Uh, uh, examples of Ric Flair's schedule in the 1980s, you know it wasn't atypical. He did this all the time. He talked about all the women he'd have with him, vowed, quote, I don't do no jobs in front of 70,000 people. That's what he said. And after beating Dusty Rhodes, he was going to go to the Hyatt, and he was going to buy drinks and champagne for all the women there. And Man. I, would, I would be remiss if I did not note this purple striped suit he had, one of his very best. And Flair was the man. Oh, yeah. You had the, the best world champion there was. Road Warriors versus Bill Tab and Ray Trailer. <laughs> Four very large human beings. Just a squash. It was a total squash, and the Warriors grabbed these men who were virtually their own size and just threw them around with ease. Warriors, by the way, also doing this show in Atlanta and then flying to New Orleans. And they, in their case, they had to wrestle at least two more matches. They may, I, they may have wrestled four times this day. I'm not sure. Well, if you count this as a wrestling match. It, hey, the they, bell rang. They had a one-minute squash. They did moves. <laughs> they pinned a the guy. They didn't even do, like, the real deal doomsday device. They did not do the doomsday device. Hawk just, it, it was a heart attack, except Hawk came off the top rope. Basically, yeah. yeah. And, and if they did they did beat Bill Tab, not Ray Trailer, because they were starting to get impressed by Ray Trailer, yes. and he was going to be something. Yes. Bill Tab was not. No. Bill Tab was beaten. Bill Tab was a large guy and had nothing else going on. It's fine. A per a, there are very few bad Road Warrior squashes. See, part of the problem was early on, the stuff like the Road Warriors match was like 30 seconds maybe. Mm -hmm. And then there was a Nighthawk match in Oahu. I mean, all of these matches were short. And then later, it was after the Magnum squash, which was maybe five seconds as always. And then Jimmy Garvin came out and decided he was going to go an hour. And then everybody had to go an hour. I guess. Couldn't they have just given the Road Warriors 30 more seconds I don't and know. shaved 30 seconds off that Garvin match? I don't know. Dusty Rhodes and Baby Doll came out for a promo. Dusty had a hell of a cowboy head on. 
made him like at least six inches taller. He noted that he also refused to do jobs in front of 70,000 people and ran his mouth for a while. Jimmy Valiant came in for a promo. <laughs> Last time we saw this man, he was heartbroken and despondent. No more. He got better. Dude, this guy, first off, he's doing his crazy Jimmy Valiant promo, and fans are just howling at this guy. Like, he spouts out his lines, and people are just laughing outright at him. He cannot remember Shaska's new name. No. He asked repeatedly, what's his name? David? And David would tell him, and then he would call him Shitska. <laughs> That's what he said. Which I don't know if he meant to or not, but he kept calling him Shitska. He called him an Uncle Tom. Yes. For betraying the only true brother he would have in this world. He vowed to shave him bald in 85 or 86. <laughs> Even though this was in 86. My guess would be probably 86. <laughs> it's going to be difficult to do 85. And it was fucking great. It was ins- absolutely insane. He talked about how Pez Watley had come crawling to his hotel room early in the morning in rough shape and he had saved Watley's life. Then he got Watley out of a bad situation in a bad joint late at night in Philadelphia. I can only imagine. That's probably all true. And uh, it was great. And I want to add here, uh, I'm using a new uh, text editing software called, ironically, Text Edit. And uh, it has autocorrected every time, and this is relevant, every time I type Watley, it has autocorrected it to Whiteley. (laughs) (laughs) Why would it autocorrect it to that? I don't know. You know another one? Oh, Tell I, me. I could go on and on about this goddamn autocorrect on my iPhone. Every time I try to write fucking, <laughs> it changes it to ducking. Oh, yeah. Have you ever in your life, for any reason, wrote the word ducking in a text message? Very rarely. You're sitting there typing, I'm trying to type this message, but people are throwing shit and I am ducking. Why the fuck would you ever use the term ducking in a text message? I don't have an answer for that. It's infuriating. Nighthawk versus Gene Ligon. This match went less than a minute, and Nighthawk still managed to flat out drop Ligon on a body slam. <laughs> he lifted him up. Well, he's trying to throw him over his shoulder for his finish. I guess. So he technically fucked up his finish, the shoulder breaker. He threw him over his shoulder, and then he just fell off the dude's shoulder. And then he put him on his shoulder he again. Did his shoulder breaker again. Hit it. Nighthawk, green as grass. Oh, yeah. This may this may have been his only televised match. I don't even know if he has another one. I kind of hope so. <laughs> because he's out of the business. He's not very good. Like next month. Yeah. The Rock and Roll Express got a promo. Oh, my God. This team... How could you around... hate this show? <laughs> How is it possible that no one ever did the Randy Savage ring bell gimmick to Robert Gibson? To give him an excuse to not cut promos. They should have done this every two or three months. He was so bad. What's the magician duo? Excuse me? The magician duo in Vegas with the tiger? Um, oh, God. Penn and Teller. No, but they're, they're one too. The guy with the mute. Penn and Teller is the mute. Yeah. Yes. They should have been like Penn and Teller. Who has the mirage? I know who you're talking about. Oh, my God. How can I not remember this? Siegfried and Roy. That's right. Siegfried and Roy. They should have been like Penn and Teller. They should have been like Penn and Teller. Where one guy did all the talking, which would be Ricky Morton, because he was awesome. You know what's funny about this team? I always voted for the Rock and Roll Express to go into the Hall of Fame, the Observer Hall of Fame. I argued it every year, and Dave would say, no, the Midnight Express should go in, but not the Rock and Rolls. And I would always remember that... When I was coming up in wrestling as a young grappler, everybody would tell me, because I was small, I was a baby face, and they would say, you got to watch the Rock and Roll Express, and you got to watch Ricky Morton. Learn how to sell and be a great baby face. It's all I heard. But when I think about it now, Robert Gibson is in the goddamn Hall of Fame. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was a competent wrestler. He was a good wrestler. It's not even like... A miserable promo. It's not even like Ricky Morton was the good worker and Robert Gibson was the good talker. No. And so you put them together and you've got a great team. It was like, this was this was Ricky Morton was the tag team and then there was a guy. Yes. You had to have a, you, because the little girls, you had to have a brunette and you had to have a blonde. 
Okay. That's just how it went. And this was the brunette they found. Yeah. You with the eye. Come here. Yeah. Uh, Marty Jannetty has an unfair reputation as far as being the worst half of a tag team. No, he doesn't. <laughs> you, weren't in, you weren't at WrestleMania weekend when he was gallivanting in a fucking uh, uh, 2016. Fountain. Yeah. The gap between Morton and Gibson is much greater than the gap between Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. Absolutely correct. Okay. So Morton cut a promo. Nothing against the guy. No. <laughs> but he was just, just terrible. This Ricky Morton dragged him around for a decade and made him a star. Ricky Morton was phenomenal. And he cut a great promo here. Ricky deserved to go in the Hall of Fame all by himself. So he put the whole goddamn team in. It should have been Ricky Morton going in twice. And then not Gibson. So it would be the Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morton, and Ricky Morton. The Rock and Rock Express. Uh. Yeah. He's more of the role. All right. I don't even know how to argue that, so I'll move on. Because Robert Gibson was just a rock. I see. <laughs> he well just he certainly a, wasn't the rock. He could have been a stone. Okay. <laughs> Ricky did all the work. Wahoo Daniel versus a terrible wrestler named Vernon Deaton. Oh, come on. Vernon Deaton cannot take his snap mare correctly. Couldn't do anything. Couldn't do anything. Wahoo goes to throw him out of the ropes. I was a terrible pro wrestler, and the first time someone threw me between the ropes to get out of the ring, I did it exactly right. Vernon Deaton getting thrown through the ropes out of the ring. He would have been safer jumping out of a helicopter. He catches himself to the ropes. He gets hung on the apron for a while, and then he just drops and disappears. Wahoo used a lot of chops. He used a lot of face holds. Not head or neck locks. Face holds. And finally, he goes for the chop elbow smash combo. But he hits the chop, and Deaton takes a bump for it, and then sits up like the Undertaker. So as he's sitting up, Wahoo says, fuck it. And drops an elbow very hard into his head anyway and pins him. A bad match. You know, first off, David Crockett, thank God he was back because he loves the shit out of these chops. He'll chop anything in sight, he screams. Which would have been a great vignette. Which reminds me that when I was also a young grappler, I would open up the door and I'd practice chopping the door frame. So I learned how to throw chops. Just chop that damn door frame. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I was like, Wahoo. Except Wahoo was the legit... He came off as the toughest fucker around. He was 48 years old. He hardly had the best physique. He didn't move fast, and he didn't do anything flashy. But when he got in there and he beat the shit out of Vernon Deaton, all you could think was, I gotta stay away from this fucker. Yes. Because he'd beat the shit out of me. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt. This was a tough old bastard. And I say that with all possible respect. So Paul Jones and Shaska Watley cut a promo. They get introduced. They immediately begin shouting o- over each other. It's very chaotic. It's very loud. It's hard to keep track of what's going on. I believe they were talking about Jones said he wanted Valiant back so now they could finish the job. They don't want to finish the, finish the job over the telephone. So we ended up going back to watch this whole thing. I encourage you all to go watch the segment. Watch Paul Jones, and particularly just watch the, the the tone of his skin. Because he literally changes from tan to pink to red right before your eyes. I swear to you, you can see the color f- taking over his face. It is amazing. Are you ready for me to play this? I'm ready if you are. I queued this goddamn thing up because... <laughs> Let me just play it, and then we will discuss it after... It airs here on the program. Shaska Watley, or as he was also known as Shitska Watley, and number one Paul Jones. Paul Jones, Shaska Watley, you've been asking about Jimmy Valiant, and we heard Jimmy Valiant, and he, you know, Jimmy Valiant scared me for a while because I didn't think he was coming back. He calls me Mad Dog. Just because, let me tell you something, you don't call me mad dog, because all I'm doing, I believe in getting justice, and justice will be done in 86, and Valiant, I'm glad you're back, because we can't finish the job over the telephone, and this man right here, you called him your friend, he was never your friend, you used him, you used him, and from now on, Valiant, please stay around, so this man can finish the job, when we're finished, you're going to be a bald-headed geek! I'm okay. 
<laughs> it gets better every what? time. It's the, Look at his face. It's, it's red. <laughs> it's so, so much there. It's the, this time, I really picked up on the, mm, when he was done. Vinny, first off, mm-hmm. uh, every week I want you to apologize for all the terrible things that you said about Paul Jones over I the I don't years. know what was wrong with me. Perhaps he was... This from, guy should be in the Hall of Fame. Perhaps he declined in 87 when I really started watching. I want you to think about something. Robert Gibson is in the Hall of Fame. And Paul Jones and is not. And number one Paul Jones is not. That, that is a That is a miscarriage of justice That's right no there. no good. So, Shaska screen for a while. Let's hear him say geek one more time. It's my favorite part. And please stay around so this man can finish the job. When we're finished, you're going to be a ball headed you geek. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that's right, boss. <laughs> now, there is more. Because Shaska runs his mouth for a while. He just says he's going to give Valiant a wep- whipping. He's going to take more of his hair. And finally, he stops, and he makes his exit. And Jones pauses, and he looks in the camera. And finally, he grunts out, You're going to get it! And then he leaves. He is my hero. He is my goddamn hero. So they leave. There's about two seconds of pausing. And then in walks J.J. Dillon, baffled <laughs> by what he's just seen. He eventually rails against Ronnie Garvin for taping his fist. So there's probably all kinds of loaded weapons in there. He demands that either Garvin prove he has a broken hand and get a full cast, or prove he's healthy and stop taping his goddamn fist. I'd like to add before we go on, going back to Wahoo, when his match was over, I would be remiss if I did not mention that David Crockett referred to him, and I quote, as the mighty chief. Wahoo McDaniels. What a great fucking name. The Mighty Chief? God, the Mighty Chief Wahoo McDaniels. <laughs> it's McDaniel, by the way, but that doesn't matter to David Crock. No. He should have been the champion for like a hundred years. Every week that I see Wahoo, I love him even more. Yeah. <laughs> Wah- He's just so great. Wahoo was great. You mentioned that he wasn't doing neck holds. He was doing face holds. Yeah. Because his job was to put you in pain. He would grab the guy's nose or cheek or ear and just yank on it. Wahoo was awesome. You know what Wahoo was? Wahoo on this show is kind of like what Undertaker is now. Yeah, sort of. He is the, the, the legend who's peak maybe a few years back, but he's still the guy everyone calls out and wants to beat to prove how tough they are. Kind of, but even with The Undertaker, he's, he's 51 now, mm-hmm. and, and he looks like he's going to fall apart at any time. Yes. Wahoo looks like he could be the mighty chief till he's about 85. Fair. Because no youngster is going to come up. He's a, he's a big, solid. He doesn't move a lot. He doesn't have to do anything athletic. He just fucking grabs you, throws you down, and tears at your face. Stop that chief. Magnum TA beat Paul Garner with a belly-to-belly in 20 seconds. This guy have the best job in the world or what? It's up there. It is way up there. I can't there. remember the last match he had that went more than 30 seconds. And this went about 15. Even David even David Crockett was half asleep for the belly to belly. Yes. Paul Ellering cut a promo. This is one of those promos where a man speaks, he goes for about a minute, and he's done. And as soon as he's done, I go to write down what he said and I realize I have no idea what he said. I have no idea what he said that was entertaining or relevant about anything. He just spoke for a minute. I presume he said the Road Warriors would win the Crockett Cup, probably deal with the Russians and the Midnight Express along the way. Well, here we go. That's where the show fell off a cliff. That's where my life fell off a cliff. I may never recover. Jimmy Garvin versus George South. You know, let me preface this. Let me let me review this match by saying that the baby had been upstairs eating during this. And my wife and I alternate baby time so that she can sleep in the evening. She goes to bed early. I watch the baby. When the baby is deep asleep, I go and I put the baby in her room. And so she gets as much sleep as humanly possible. And we sleep in shifts, as they say. So I knew that as soon as the baby was done eating, it was going to be my turn to watch the baby. I had to make dinner. So I thought, man, I'm going to have to make dinner in the middle of NWA World Championship Wrestling. I hope I don't miss anything. And I went over, and I made a stir-fry in a wok. 
That means I put together all of the meat, I put together all of the vegetables, I got the noodles ready, I got the rice ready. I put everything in the wok, I cooked everything in the wok, I put the rice in the bowl, I put everything in the wok on the bowl, I went over and I sat down to eat. This goddamn match was still going on. I cooked an entire meal during this match. Let me tell you something. I missed nothing. The 15 minutes you missed was a terrible 15 minutes. Garvin took this guy who everyone knew was going to lose. He used hammer locks. Oh, I was watching. He used chin locks. He used a leg lock. The announcers were just desperate for anything relevant or interesting to say. My favorite part of this match, and that is low praise, but there was a point where they tried to do worked amateur wrestling to make Garvin look like he was smothering him like Kurt Angle. It didn't work. So my mind began to wander during this eons long match. Like, how could anyone in the 1980s not have turned the channel? I realize there were, if you were lucky, 20 channels in the 1980s. But for God's sake, one of them had to have something better on than this. One of them had to. And then I began to wonder about remote controls. When exactly did they become common? I know we, I think we got our first one around this time. Perhaps in the 1980s, they weren't common. Obviously, they were invented. But maybe most people didn't have them. And so for most people... That extra eight feet to walk to the TV and turn the knob, maybe that was too much trouble. And so they stayed in this match. But otherwise, I cannot fathom anyone staying tuned into this. In about a day, Garvin won with the Brain Buster. You know, when I was young, around this time actually, my dad had a remote control, which was a long stick that he had cut a notch into the end of. (laughs) Your dad is awesome. Uh... And he would reach that stick, and he would somehow get the notch. This was the most impressive thing about it. He got the notch on the... The knob. Knob, and he would turn the channel. Yeah. I'm trying to remember who had it. I swear somebody I knew had a TV. It had a remote control, but the remote control actually had a cord. (laughs) So it wasn't that remote. Now, with all that in mind... That was not the worst match on the show. <laughs> oh, my God. Or the longest. Listen, I love Ivan Koloff. I've argued many times this man is a Hall of Famer. He should go into the Hall of Fame merely for selling for Tony Zane. <laughs> but by the time this match was over, ah. Uh, you could build a Hall of Fame, and a physical Hall of Fame, and erect a building, and the time it took for this match to go on. Literally, this had to have won worst match of the year. First, Rage and Bull cut a promo hyping up his match against Darn. He was excited that Oli wasn't there, he'd get a fair fight. Then, Jimmy Garvin and Precious cut a promo. They ran down Wahoo. Said, I'm tired of chasing this man. I may have to target somebody else. I'm the best wrestler and the prettiest man in the world. It's a good thing he could talk. And then, Ivan Koloff versus Tony Zane. Tony Zane. This match legit had to be longer than Koloff's world championship ring. <laughs> Where was Tony Zane when you were breaking in? He'd have carried he, your bags. I was going to say, he may, st- he may have still been training. He would have been the guy, you would have been inside the car when we locked him out. Yes. <laughs> this uh, fucking guy. He, this was so bad. He didn't know how to run the ropes. He didn't know how to take an elbow. He didn't know how to take a bump. At this point, I wrote, this went forever as Koloff refused to pin Tony Zane. And then after that, let's see, after I wrote that it went too long. He and, kept going. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find a word count on here. Uh, not easily. I wrote about the 100 words after that. And why? It's, I feel like it's my job to record what's going on. <laughs> what did you record? That it kept going and you were ready to kill yourself? In all capitals, pin him, hit him with a move, and pin him. This is an all-time terrible episode of the show. The actual Cold War didn't go as long as this match. They tease a count out. It went through a break. <laughs> that was funny. It, it, went, it goes to the break, and Shivani says, we'll be back with our number two. And I thought he meant of this specific match. Zayn made a second comeback. You yeah. know what's funny? It went so long that when he made the second comeback, everybody actually went nuts. I couldn't it, even believe my eyes. because they had seen Ivan hit 7,000 moves in a row. 
noticed anything different. So finally, Ivan hit a Russian oh. sickle, a hideous bump by the fat man, and Ivan won. This was really, really, really bad. It's an abomination of a match. It was hideous. Russians got a promo. Imagine if you wrote a speech or a promo, whatever. How about, how about I, I got one better for you? Okay. I have an easier time understanding Ahmed Johnson. Oh, easily. Yeah. If you, Nikita's promos, just imagine, write down any sentence or any paragraph, whatever you want, and then go through and replace all the consonants with like M or V, and that's it. <laughs> and then try to decipher it. By the time this promo was over, I thought, you know what's coming next? It's going to be the Baron. But I was wrong. Even they knew to follow all of this up with a Baron Von Raschke match would have been a bad idea. Ivan ran down Americans for smoking, and this also went on and on. Dusty and Baby, Baby Doll returned. This was interesting. Baby Doll vowed to take care of Dusty's trip to New Orleans, and she disappeared. She said, don't worry if you don't see me there tonight. I'm just... Handling the travel arrangements. I missed that line. Foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. So she disappeared. We got Arn Anderson versus Raging Bull with Dusty doing commentary, often shown on an inset promo. God, this Dusty. This was not the mid-90s funny Uncle Dusty Rhodes deal. This was mid-80s know-it-all Frank Mir Dusty. <laughs> it's true. He just goddamn knew everything about everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never... By the way, first and only time you are here, Dusty Rhodes compared to Frank Mir. You haven't seen Frank Mir lately. I guess I have not. <laughs> <laughs> He's reaching dusty proportions. He's a splotch. He's one giant splotch. Didn't he gain a lot of weight after his motorcycle crash and then say he never get fat again? Well, you know. Things change. Yeah. yeah. So, I guess this was a good match. It was the best thing on this show in quite a while. If if this would have if this would have followed, like if we would have taken after the Magnum squash, if you would have taken the Tony Zane match and the Jimmy Garvin match off the show and put this match in, it probably would have been much better. This but was it followed such insufferable action. This was a very good ten minute match dragged out over twenty minutes. It went a long time. And that was actually the idea of the match. Arn was trying to stall out the TV time limit. Arn's the TV champion. There's a 20-minute time limit. If he gets to a draw, he retains his title. So that was his goal. So ordinarily, a match will consist of three parts. The shine, as it's sometimes called, where the babyface destroys the bad guy. The heat, where the bad guy cheats to take advantage and gets his offense in. And then the finish, where there's a comeback, and they go back and forth and do whatever the end is. And usually, those are all about the same time. In this 20-minute match, the shine went about 18 and a half minutes. <laughs> just Raging Bull just beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him. Finally, Arn like, kicks him into the corner, and Bull goes down, and then Tony says, we're almost out of time. So they did some stuff. Manny comes back, hits the flying form. The time limit draw expires, and Arn gets his leg on the ropes. So was the draw. I think Arn was just covering all of his bases. I guess so. The bell didn't ring when it was supposed to. So here's the way they did for the post-match. J.J. Dillon comes out to argue with Dusty. As they're shouting at each other, which is not shown on camera, but it's heard, Tully Blanchard hits the ring, and the horsemen begin to double-team Rage and Bull. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can hear David Crockett screaming at Dusty to turn around. That's right. But Dusty is focused on Dillon. For like 30 seconds, this goes on until finally Dusty realizes what's going on, and Garvin comes out and hits the ring, and they chase the horsemen away. Ron Garvin, I should clarify. Have they mentioned, by the way, there's a guy named Ron Garvin on the show and a guy named Jimmy Garvin on the show. Eventually, they talk about them being brothers. But have they even hinted at it here? No. That's odd. Jim Cornette cut a promo. He vowed the Minute Express to win the Crockett, Cro Crockett Cup. This was the best promo of the year so far. You were so far gone, you didn't hear a word he I, said. No, you're right. He was I, I, I was, awesome. I was past, long past the point of no return. This show has killed me, I wrote. Yeah, he said they win the Crockett Cup. They would beat the Road Warriors, beat the Rockland Express. He, to make a long story short, he said Magnum and TA and Dusty Rhodes, they wanted a contract for a tag title match, but they never ever wrestled as a team. So, no. Which was a great point. 
We got the Midnight Express versus Art Pritz and Bob Pearson. The highlight was where Bobby Eaton dragged one of the geeks over the announce desk. This so, would be Pearson. So Shivani's microphone could pick up his screams. Listen, God bless this Pearson fella. I could not find a thing about him. There was a Bob Pearson that recently passed away. I don't know if it's the same guy. I have no idea. All I know is he was a different kind of appalling jobber. He looked about 55 years old, bald on top, didn't even trim the rest, totally pale, hairy, and skinny. Perfect. And he was beaten unmercifully. <laughs> That's what jobbers should be. They hit him with a bombs away knee drop, and then they go and they're going to hit him with the skull-crushing finale, Dennis Condry. The Miz's goddamn finish. Every time that I've seen Dennis Condry do this, I've been blown away by how awesome this move looks. Because when Miz does it, it doesn't look this awesome. No. Well, it didn't look awesome here either. Because Bob Pearson could not get in the proper position to take the move, number one. And number two, I thought that he was going to be killed taking this move. <laughs> yeah, but he, he lost. Dylan and Blanchard came out for a promo. Blanchard's face was all cut up. Stitches and blood everywhere. And Dylan's talking about all the brutal matches he's been through. And Blanchard said, Blanchard cut a great promo. I was awake enough to recognize this. He says, scars like this were the sign of a man who had survived and thrived in this business. And through all the damage, all the barbed wire matches, all the strap matches, I'm still here. I'm still a champion, and I'm still talking. That was great. Called Baby Doll a moose again. A few people called her a moose. I think Cornette did, too. That's right. That's her, it's her gimmick. She's a moose. Mm -hmm. It's not very nice. No. I suppose it's not. Ronnie Garvin cut a promo considering his taped-up fist. The NWA apparently wants to bar him from wearing tape on his fist, but it's just a rumor because nobody's told him anything yet. I see. <laughs> what an organization. And then he said, I'm even dangerous when I'm asleep. He said, I'm dangerous either way. I'm even dangerous when I'm asleep. The hell does that mean? Let's not find out. So Ronnie Garvin wrestled Brody Chase. <laughs> this was Ronnie Garvin. David Crockett was so done with this show, much like you. Yes, even David Crockett knew this was a bad show. Ronnie Garvin applied his favorite sugar hold that David Crockett mentions every goddamn single time he applies it. Except this time. Garvin puts him in the sugar hold, and David Crockett doesn't even notice. And then... Ronnie Garvin, I guess to make sure David Crockett noticed, he adds a grapevine, or as Pedro Sauer calls it, grape the vine, to the man's legs. A sugar hold with a grape the vine. Now, this jobber cannot get the fuck out of this hold. <laughs> He's trapped. He's near death. But goddammit, he won't give up. He's in there for like five minutes. Finally, he taps the mat violently, but it's 1986, so that's not a submission. And eventually, Garvin just lets go, and they keep wrestling. Yes. So Garvin's hand was hurt, so instead of winning with the knockout punch, he won with a knee lift and a splash. It's too bad Garvin was such a shitty promo, because he did come across like a tough guy, mm -hmm. and he had great matches. Yeah. Even the squash was a fun squash, mostly because of the sugar hold with the grape divine. The main event was the Boogie Woogie Man returning for another promo. <laughs> Jimmy Valiant comes back. He's already done a promo an hour <laughs> earlier. Yeah. He cannot fucking remember Shaska Watley's name. He asks for the third time, what's his name again? Shiska. He also can't remember Napoleon's name. No. He's talking about how Paul Jones is a complex because he's so short. And he turns to Tony and says, who is that guy who put his hand on his chest like this? Tony just says, Napoleon. Napoleon! That's it. He's ranting and raving, and he explains. In his words, he has been talking to the brothers in the street. The real brothers. And they said, Shaska, he was no brother. And he vowed again that Paul Jones will be bald. And then thank the Lord above, this show ended. A historically awful program. Oh, come on. This was the best thing on the show. They're both... Fine! This is the best feud. <laughs> so what? They're both threatening to shave the other one bald. That's true. One of these men, at the end of the day, is going to be a bald-headed geek. Or, as Paul Jones would say, 
a geek. Mm. <laughs> it's a, it's a three syllable word now. Yeah, and the middle syllable is really long. One more time. I got it right here. I'm a ball in it. A geek. I'm going to you that's right, Oh my lord! Uh, bald-headed a geek. And why does everyone like to mention it's 1986? Why is that such a big deal? It's in so 86? important. I'm going to get my revenge in 86. And it, it's, it's everybody. A- it's April. If it was the new year, okay. No, 